Good evening and welcome to the Center for Architecture. It's my privilege uh, as Executive Director of the AIA to welcome you all here tonight for what promises to be a very exciting program as part of the design in the Heart of New York series. That's presented by related companies in the Oxford Properties Group and um, we'll be um, both doing a presentation of course down here, a conversation down here, but there's a uh, reception afterwards in the gallery where some of you I know have already seen the show and uh, others will have a chance tonight to do so. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Liz Diller, David Rockwell, AIA, and Julie Evian for a conversation with the title of the Conceptual and Technical Development of the Residential Tower at Hudson Yards. That's a catchy title. Uh, Oh, I go off on some tangents, but I know you're all waiting to hear from the, the, the speakers. Uh, additionally, a very warm welcome to the students who are here tonight from the Columbia University Real Estate Development Program. One of the tangents was going to be that old fight song from Columbia, Who Owns New York? And we'll do that maybe at the reception. I'm wearing my blue tie. Um, tonight marks the final event in what has become uh, a compelling, a very exciting series, very different from things that we've done before. In many ways, uh, uh, I wish we could continue it into the next two months. And why is that? Well, over the course of the last eight weeks, we've had a full lineup of architects, designers, the civic leaders, everyone really who's been involved in the Hudson Yards project and are envisioning the transformation of these 26 acres on Manhattan's west side. Uh, the speaker series, as I said, comes to an end tonight, um, but we're pleased to announce that the exhibition is going to continue for two more months uh, by popular demand and, and by agreement with Related. And um, for those who, amongst your acquaintances and friends, colleagues have not seen it, uh, they'll be able to do so um, uh, through Labor Day weekend. So following tonight's talk, uh, please, yes, do join us upstairs for a reception in the gallery uh, where the mutable part, the architect's gallery so-called, the part in the back near the garden, has rotated once more to feature the subject of tonight's talk, the D Tower. I guess D, there's a D in residential. Uh, 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 so without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce this evening's uh, moderator, my friend Julie, who as an architecture critic and editor and author has uh, um, come here on many, many other occasions, uh, but also um, come to the writing about architecture a little bit circuitously. I didn't really know that until reading this bio. But, um, uh, it was through studying ancient Greek, and it says hanging out at the ANA library. I used to hang out there, but I never really read much there. I'm sure you did. Uh, the, then working for Cesar Pelli, who was then the uh, dean of the Yale Architecture School. Uh, decade covering design and architecture as reported with the Times, and we've all read all of the articles. And then um, more recently, executive editor of the Architects newspaper from 2007 until 2012. Uh, in 2009, you were invited by Ada Louise to uh, do some reporting and sort of back up uh, 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 with her for, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, now you write uh, the column there much more frequently. And with great pleasure, do we welcome you here. I'll turn the program over to you, Julie. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I hope everyone here is truly here for the content, not just the air conditioning, but, uh, but I hope both will, will satisfy. Uh, our two uh, featured uh, architects today hardly need any kind of introduction, but I've cherry-picked some of my favorite bits from, uh, from their bios. Liz Diller is a founding principal of Diller, Scafidio, and Renfo, now a 85-strong interdisciplinary design studio integrating visual and performing arts with architecture. Liz did not pay tuition at Cooper Union, where she got her architecture degree in 1979, and uh, since 1990, she's also, in addition to the, to the, the heavy practice, uh, been a professor of architecture at Princeton. You know the projects, by and large, the blur of the Swiss Expo in 2002, ICA in Boston, the first new museum in 100 years, uh, completed in 2006, the High Line, Lincoln Center Master Plan, and many other aspects. The new work on the boards is uh, uh, unbelievably uh, also expansive. The, the recently announced and highly fraught expansion of the Museum of Modern Art, the Broad Art Museum in LA, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Center in Berkeley, uh, for you Columbia guys, Columbia, two buildings, Columbia University Medical Center, Columbia University Graduate School of Business, 
Museum of Image and Sound in Copacabana, the Disona Factory and Housing in China, Stanford University Art and Art History Building, at which point on the page I kind of blurred myself because it's an impressive amount of work and you two need a clone. Uh, in 2010, Fast Company named DSNR one of the 50 most innovative companies uh, in the world. So that is Liz Diller and David Rockefeller, no slouch himself, is founder of Rockwell Group, <laughs> now numbering 140 with uh, satellite offices in Madrid and Shanghai. Uh, Rockwell Group also uh, takes a cross-disciplinary approach, incorporating theater, technology, craft, film, to create high-definition narratives for each project. Way too many to name here, but the projects range from airport terminals and hospitals, restaurants, museum exhibitions, and Broadway sets. Among them, no, all the Nobu restaurants you've ever been to in the world, W Hotels, Film Center at Lincoln Center, JetBlue at JFK, the Imagination Playground Initiative, sets for the 2001 and 2000, 2009 and 2010 Academy Awards, and also Broadway sets for Kinky Boots, Hairspray, Catch Me If You Can, and numerous other, other uh, Broadway shows that have attracted nominations for three Tonys and four Drama Desk Awards. So these are our two uh, featured speakers. The evening will progress this way. We have a little presentation on Tower D so everyone knows uh, what we're talking about, and we'll follow that with a uh, conversation. And then we will also open the floor to questions. Thank you, Liz and David. Um, thanks, Julie, and, um, and thanks, Rick. Um, thank you for having this place. Um, thank God there are still places to show architecture, have a discourse around it, and there are still writers that write and, and publications that publish stuff about architecture. So um, I, you know, I was just recalling uh, when we first met uh, David, it was at the um, invitation of Herbert Mouchamp, and Herbert said, you got to meet this guy, David Rockwell. He's really great. And I, and I, Rick and I thought, why would we want to meet David Rockwell? You know, I mean. Rockefeller, maybe. Ro not. <laughs> Rockefeller. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's know. Who. <laughs> exactly. I thought that. But um, we just thought, oh, kind of, our world, worlds are so far apart. And um, it didn't make any sense. And um, Herbert brought us together. And uh, uh, we learned quickly that, that David is one of the, most conceptual architects there is out there, and that we had a really great alignment um, and discussion about architecture and the state of things, and we do different stuff, but we also have been cooking up lots of ideas over the years, and some of them are actually coming to fruition. I don't know if you want to say anything. Well, the, so when we, the, the way we actually first met was I saw a talk you were giving at the Whitney, and Herbert suggested we get together, and we started a talk about what you're doing. And, and I remember I was struck by the studio's theater work originally and the sort of architectural quality of the theater work. And as we started talking about the architecture we're doing, there was a kind of theatrical overlay to that. And, um, and we have dreamed up many, many things, many of which haven't happened. But I think in some ways that's prepared us to collaborate on this much bigger thing that is happening. And um, it's an incredible, I mean, DSR is an incredible studio to collaborate with, and from, from my point of view, it's a chance to elevate every element to a level of obsession, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and to, um, like any relationship that's really going to work, not worry about boundaries. And it's um, for a practice like yours that doesn't look at the boundaries between the different disciplines, that's really been the, the process of this project. So and it's, it's kind of phenomenal now that it's really happening. And I have to say that the collaboration has been extremely fluid. Um, it doesn't feel like um, someone from the outside. You know, I mean, just it, it, it has been a very, very healthy exchange and a very li little ego definition, and the teams have been very, uh, synthetic. Um, and, and, and one of the ways we made that work, if you think about a collaboration that's successful, is um, it has been a synthetic team. And it's been a team in which uh, everyone has been able to say whatever they need to say. 
Um, and that is analogous to theater, in fact, where there's much more of a kind of spirit of collaboration. Um, so it's been great. Hopefully the building will be as great as the collaboration. So just to, um, the little bit of a historic framework for this particular project is that, uh, that David and our studio responded to an RFP from the city um, to figure out a use for a very small parcel of land, about 21,000 square feet, uh, which is now the culture shed. Um, it's not going to be the topic of today's discussion, but that's what kind of started um, our discussion around Hudson Yards. And, um, you know, for, for our studio, um, that the location of, of this particular spot on Earth is, um, it's just kind of magical because we have been, we've had the great fortune of being able to do a lot of work on the west side. Like, for some reason, nobody on the east side likes us. Um, and so we're the, like, the super local west side architects um, with the High Line and, um, and Lincoln Center and the Columbia University projects. This piece of land um, of Hudson Yards is just like a like a brave new world. Um, it it uh, is right on the edge of uh, of the High Line and very very proximate. Um, and it's you know it's the center, as you guys all know, very very large development of which um, the springboard was the culture shed. And and the culture shed, important to note, wasn't an RFP for architecture. It was a RFP for ideas, really. And um, Liz, is, Liz and her studio and her partners had been thinking about it. I had been thinking about it. So this grows out of starting with the culture shed and then being invited by uh, Related to think about a residential building that um, began slightly removed from the culture shed and be, for a number of reasons um, became part of it. So the building you'll see today sits at the base of uh, that new culture building. Um, and in fact, as you know, there is a, a, a kind of standard model of a cultural institution with uh, some kind of high rise above. This is a little bit different. These are um, kind of joined at the hip um, and using and utilizing some um, joint resources like a core and, um, um, and some office space and so forth that we were um, able to, um, to really kind of configure both of these projects together at the same time. So um, uh, our collaboration is Culture Shed and the, the Tower. Um, and they're really two distinct projects with two distinct clients, but still conjoined, um, literally physically, um, and uh, programmatic. there's a programmatic exchange. Um, so um, I'm going to just start flipping through slides, and um, David and I can just explain the building a little bit. Uh, and um, and I, I should also say that, that it was the idea of doing um, a high-rise tower it was to us the scariest thing on earth because we had now done, we graduated from installations to cultural buildings and then all of a sudden a residential tower for a developer was really totally out of our league and we were scared shitless. Um, but at the same time, um, the um, I think the opportunity was just um, to do a, a first tower, uh, to do it collectively, and on the site um, with a client that was very supportive of both projects and being able to propel them both together as an ensemble. And there were uh, synergies to the buildings being together as opposed to being separate that, um, that benefited both projects. Okay, so uh, the, the tower itself um, is located on the corner of 11th Avenue and 30th Street. Um, it occupies a corner site, which is about 95 feet wide and 130 deep. And I have, John Newman is sitting in the second row to catch every f uh, flaw I make. He's a project architect uh, in our studio. And um, uh, so hopefully supplement some of the maybe technical questions as and, well. And if you have a chance to look upstairs at the exhibit, you'll see how the project has morphed and changed. And part of what's changed is the footprint, where the primary entrance is, where the secondary entrance is. So there's every iteration of it, every sketch model is up there. And on the eastern rail yard, it holds that, um, that southwesterly corner um, and as the site is laid out, all the corners are, are pegged, um, and, uh, and this is ours. Okay, so question is, well, um, yeah, what comes 
uh, you know, how, how do we think about the tower in a fresh way? We've already gone through a lot of history in this, uh, in this century. And um, we started to just simply say, okay, starting from an extrusion, there are buildings with bottoms, there are buildings with tops. Um, there are very few buildings with middles. And um, we started to get really um, obsessed about how to make a building with a consequential middle particularly when we started to think about programmatically what could exist in that middle that would not only separate itself from other buildings in the area, but give a reason for that to be the iconic piece that you see. And um, as we started to work on the project, we actually, we went through tons and tons of iterations. The two on the right um, are middle studies. Um, and... Uh, we, we ultimately came to what is the current project, um, which uh, effectively, uh, when, we, when we began the project, the, the program was um, half rental, half condos. Um, and uh, for us, the opportunity to kind of make a joint that was meaningful between these two housing types and uh, a potential community space in the middle, a communal space, um, would um, act, activate this this middle zone. Are you going to go? Does the flower scheme reappear here? Or is that, it's not. It's so not. part of what the middle also did was take a scheme that all of us liked quite a bit that was more flower-like at the top, and mediate between and transition from the tower to the to the flower scheme. So it was merging multiple schemes. Um, so so then we ultimately came to a very, very simple diagram that the rental apartments would be roughly 50% of the um, uh, of the area, which is about ultimately 260 apartments, I think, um, on 70 floors. Um, but half uh, would be um, part of an orthogonal geometry which met, met the street, and half would be uh, part of another kind of geometry, a kind of cloverleaf, that kind of smoothed out the corners and offered the diagonal views, which were ultimately um, the opportunity on the site as and, you elevated. And became something that was very important to the client in terms of justifying this move, that, that we would actually look at the city diagonally and it dealt with the other buildings that were being built that, that were right in front of our building. So um, how do you transform, how do you go from a a rectangle to a clover leaf um, through a girdle, and um, and this is this became like the going metaphor uh, for the project. You basically constrict it, and it oozes out um, the other side, and it, it actually is formed um, into something that's um, culturally. Although we um, said the word corset long before we showed this image to relate it, I think is true. Yeah. Um, and actually, this was a very early concept model that we made, and um, and and so it goes like like this, just the middle, and uh, basically it's you can see the bottom geometry rectangular, and then translating into the clover leaf. I think that this actually stopped everyone cold um, and said, "Wow, you know that this was like a very sexy model, and it got passed around, and I think everyone." just kind of got it and played with it like a puppet. And, um, and then it became um, you know, something that, that, that everyone really wanted to do because it, it also offered not only a geometric translation, but an opportunity to express glass in a slightly different way and to allow it to, um, to, to, to kind of push the, the opportunities in glass construction and fabrication um, to a slightly different level. Uh, which would have consequences and benefits for uh, the apartments. And so here uh, is a view from the, uh, from the southwest. And, um, and there's the corset. And um, then uh, there was the question of the culture shed. And um, culture shed will be a topic for a conversation probably in the early fall. Um, but the idea was always to work these into an ensemble. So um, it wouldn't be just two buildings like on any set of uh, lots in the, in the, in, on the street. These would actually, done by the same group of architects, um, uh, would, would have some kind of relationship and affinity. Um, so this is um, basically Culture Shed 
um, nested and culture shed deployed. Um, and so uh, the uh, reading there and the um, relationship and the mating of the shed to the structure of the, of the tower is, is very much expressed. And here, just showing from the southern end, uh, nested and deployed. It also uh, shows the way the strap splits at the base to allow for, so there's not an entrance from the high line, but that mirrors the entrance on the north side and does give a fantastic view down from the high line into this uh, building. And, and the high line is, um, it's, I think we have about uh, 300, about four, uh, 400 almost linear feet of adjacency between these two buildings. The plaza, the, the, the outer point of the culture shed uh, to the corner of the tower. Um, we're continuing to work on this stretch of, uh, of the High Line. And this is definitely, we think about it as High Line 3.0. It's a brave new world. It's a very different set of circumstances, very tall buildings. Um, but you could see here that, that the, there is an opportunity to occupy the space under the High Line here and to have entrances uh, beneath uh, with the opportunity to uh, take advantage of the view up at the understructure. And you can also see the northern end, the northern entrance is higher. So we have a culture shed entrance from the street that then brings you up into the building. Um, so these are three typical uh, floor plates. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a transition in the middle. There's almost actually almost like an oval at one point. Uh, and, uh, and the cruciform and then we, uh, the, the cloverleaf. And we have quite large apartments. The, the two of the floors in the oval are the amenity floors, um, two other mechanical floors. So there's a four floor bay that sits in the middle of that building. Um, early sketch uh, on the cloverleaf. And Part the of what we had to do was convince ourselves and convince the client that the curvature would um, create better units and allow more furnishable units. Um, so early sketches and then more detailed versions. Okay, and then a, a view, a one of the corner views. Um, this is uh, the trajectory of the proportions and um, looking at some of the other architects, one goes through many, many iterations in a project like this. And um, we started the project, concept design was very thin, very slender, very tall. Um, and as we worked our way through schematic and design to, to design development, the, the uh, proportions were growing in width in depth and getting a little shorter. And this is when economics really started to, um, to take shape uh, over what made sense from a marketing standpoint, uh, marketability standpoint. And so we, um, we have always kind of presented this kind of strategy of like this was the original proportion and then we went a little bit more softic <laughs> and then we went really fat and short. And then we ended up, you know, we ended up someplace kind of nice, I think. Um, so it, it kept um, changing. Um, and then uh, we did this, this project. And, and we're back up to, I believe, the same height as the concept design now because of the floor to floor. So it's been an interesting back and forth. So it's about 900 feet, so it's very close to the original yeah. proportions, a little wider. Um, the uh, project has been modeled in uh, Katia. And this is uh, the first time that we have used Katia for um, working out uh, the facades. And to do a project like this, you really have to, um, the subtlety, it's all about the subtlety, it's all about inches, it's all about um, just the reflection on a, on a radius that's, that's uh, faceted or not faceted or slightly bent. And, and where to put that money, where to put those resources, um, really was a, a long conversation. Um, so some of these slides, they're, they're more technical slides from the program, and they just um, uh, kind of document a little bit about the, how the, where the control points are and how the corset works in the translation of the geometry and the super geometries and the micro geometries. Um, and um, um, these are all the multiple <coughs> locations where there are, there are change, changing radii um, they're both vertical and horizontal. Um, and this project really would be 
totally not doable had, without the software and without being able to track and then um, find economical ways of, of pulling it off. Um, again, the, these, um, these straps, um, which are, they're not structural, but they're more um, just about expressing the transition, uh, but they, um, they have, uh, j just to get that expression down really takes a lot of uh, kind of nuance. And this, the same model allowed us to look at what each unit would be like through that structure and through those diagonals, which was critical. And, and some of these are just the kind of the nerdy, beautiful things that you do along the way to get the geometries. Um, this is a torus, basically, and the pieces, the large kind of vertical uh, uh, rounded pieces are fragments of this geometry. And um, they make for really, and you could see it here where you can see the strap location of the strap geometry, how it works with the torus and the surface as well. And here's a close-up. Um, the different color uh, glass, you, there are uh, panel, this is a panelized system, uh, four by 12 foot pieces of glass. Um, the different colors show different, uh, basically glass types. So uh, here on a single floor, we basically have um, flat glass, we have a flat cut, cut glass, the, the, the orange is flat cu cut, the white is flat. Um, the dark blue is, uh, is, is basically cold bent, um, and the light blue is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the dark blue is slumped. curved, it's slumped, and the light blue is cold bent. So um, we're able to, um, and here slumped and cold bent is also uh, part of this. And, um, and here you could see the proportion of the different uh, types of glass that are used. Now, of course, if we're successful, you won't see any of this. You'll just see these smooth transitions. But to accomplish it and to make it affordable, um, it had to be rationalized and optimized um, in a way that in, in which there was a very small percentage of, uh, of, of glass that was unique. And there... Um, you know, he, yeah, here on a, uh, in a plan, you could see all the radiuses. So there are multiple radius points, um, multiple curves that, are, uh, that make uh, this up. And this is just along the geometry. They continue to change and morph. Oops, that's a duplicate. Um, Studies of what the strap will be, how thick it is. And uh, this is uh, the window washing. And, uh, you know, this is one of the hardest things uh, that we realize now about doing the tower is that how do you get into those uh, surfaces that are undercut? Um, and we are, um, uh, so there are, there are a series, there are basically is a crane that revolves around and uh, basic, the suspension uh, platform of the, the uh, window cleaners can basically pin into at every level pin into uh, kind of progressive uh, changes in the geometry and just get into all those undercut areas. Uh, and uh, to the north, we have a, a major entrance to the north. We're going to have an entrance also to the west. And this uh, is still in and, flux. And to the south. And yeah, this is all uh, in development. And this is to the south. It's actually an early image that we may be coming back to. And, uh, and that's it. So uh, thanks, and Julie, we'll take, start the conversation. Of course, my first question is, and th thanks for being so very thorough, but where are the male nudes? <laughs> 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 the male nudes. The male nudes. Oh yeah. Okay, sorry. I'm sure they wear corsets as well. For the later. That's right. <laughs> anyway, um, so this I believe is not exactly your very first collaboration. Did you work on the the fence for 9/11 a long time ago? Um, we worked on that, and then we did work on several projects that that didn't happen. Um, one was. Um, envisioning a park on the east side at the invitation of the city. 
Uh, one was an interesting project um, in Hong Kong that didn't happen. And then we collaborated um, on New York Film Society at Lincoln Center in that we were um, you know, working on one piece and had a chance to collaborate with, with Liz and her studio on the, on the building. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, after 9-11, um, we, this was a really interesting story. We, um, everyone was in shock. Um, Rick and uh, David and I and Charles started to talk about, you know, what, what could we do? Um, it, was a, it was a kind of call to action in a way where professionals in New York just kind of tried to figure out how they could do something and anything. Um, and there was a, there was a um, kind of clamor to get to the site. Um, I think a lot of people wanted to kind of bear witness. And um, there was, it was after the rescue effort, it was in a cleanup effort. And, and I don't know if you remember, but the, the city's original request was, um, the, the, the first request was for a VIP viewing platform. And we went down to look at it together and decided that that was not a good idea, but if it was a public viewing platform, we would do it together. Um, which then triggered the city saying that would have to be privately funded. Um, and so in fact, uh, we put together a foundation and designed it and, and got it built in about 110 days um, because of the, the timing. And um, so that was all privately raised money. Yeah. And actually, it, it, it's, a, it's a good um, example of you know, just kind of um, not waiting for projects, but initiating projects and, uh, and being a little bit more entrepreneurial or, or uh, you know, just finding opportunities uh, with, with the city and with the agencies. And now, what is the, the kind of the nitty gritty of how you collaborate? Um, I'm interested not only in the process, but also what did each of you see in the other in terms of, uh, you know, what you felt the other the other group would bring to the party, so Liz. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is a really hard question. I think that we complement each other in kind of not such clear ways. You know, um, we're able to get into a, a an interesting discussion and kind of push each other um, to come up with with ideas and strategies. So I I think that. Um, you know, maybe we have different bodies of work, but we're came together is just um, being able to formulate ideas. So I, I actually, there was no real distinction. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. Um, also, it's not like it was a decision to collaborate starting with a big building. Mm -hmm. So I think there was, a, there was a, an opportunity to, you know, from my point of view, um, to work with incredibly smart, brilliant thinkers who, um, and I remember the first, one of the first things we collaborated on, which was the thing, the, the place in Hong Kong, in, in West Kowloon. West um, what, was, what was interesting to me is how everything began from program for, from Liz and Rick and Charles, which is how we begin work. They may end up looking quite different, and the programs may be different. Um, but I think it's where we both begin, and um, it's why the collaboration works. And, in this particular case, the collaboration is is somewhat seamless. It's not separate teams. It's a blended team, uh, and it's it just I think it works because everyone really wants it to work and um, doesn't look for the barriers. We, we I mean there's so many barriers in the projects themselves that those are the the things we look for. Do you each develop designs and then crit each other, or do you only present? Design develop designs in a single thread. I, I, I think we just sit at the table and we knock ideas around and we sketch and then it's just like any internal collaboration. It's done the same way. So, um, neither of us are bringing some kind of thing specific uh, specific to our own uh, vision. We're kind of try, we're blending a uh, vision. Um, I have to say that one thing that. The reason why we have this history of collaborations, and most of them died, you know, most of them didn't uh, see the light of day, but it has a lot to do with um, the kind of restlessness that both of our studios have and the, um, the desire to kind of expand the agency of the architect. Um, so 
rather than always waiting for a project for the phone to ring, um, we're constantly kind of thinking things up and maybe getting people excited about ideas. Um, sometimes it just things come, and that's that's terrific. But I, you know, I we're used to David like calling, hey, what about you know, let's do something entirely different? And we know that we're going to spend three months on it; it's going to go nowhere. But um, but we do have this kind of um, rapport. And um, and kind of a desire to kind of to to, to push the envelope um, as far as the you know the inheritance of old programs or um, with existing clients. And but you know you ask if if you look at the evolution of this project in the beginning of the culture shed, everything we talked about collaborating on from the beginning is in some way embedded in that project. So it's all a continuous series of ideas. It's not an idea stops and starts. Maybe it doesn't have an outcome in the project you're working on, but it's a you know a series of ideas that I think are critical to the thinking of the two studios. And in, in addition to the culture shed, what was really driving you know the design for this tower, in terms of uh, you know research or inspirations? Uh, well, I Fear think... was important. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I think um, <laughs> you know the. <laughs> Um, the, what what we basically that that those images that we showed um, was it was a kind of a desire to to add to the skyline in a different way and I see Jay Cross here um, related said you know I mean t took a kind of risk with us because we we had never done this kind of thing before um, you know how could we do this how could we make it um, you know, interesting for the uh, uh, you know for for the whole um, Eastern Rail Yards. How could we also um, make it work with the other buildings? How could we also be able to have our signature on it? And uh, and 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 how could it contribute to the culture of architecture in some way or to the history of um, high-rise buildings? And this is where you know we just needed to start with um, you know this. We we were very very attracted to kind of pushing the, the middle of the building. It's, it's one of the reasons why I think the notion that the um, social spaces would live in a place you could identify was pretty much in every sketch model that we did. And the idea that it would be memorable in the skyline in, an, in a unique way. And th those were two influences that really focus us on the corset <laughs> scheme. And, and also the, the rail yards is a kind of a unique place where you can actually back up and you can have a different view of, of a building. We're typically, we're used to seeing either really long distance views of the skyline in which a building, you don't know where it comes down, um, or from the street where you're looking up the face of a building and you actually can't see enough of it. Uh, you can't see its profile. But on Hudson Yards, and also because of the because of the High Line and because of the public square to the north, um, you're able to actually back up. And because you know our uh, site is on an intersection, as well, you can back up. And and the and and so it's a different. Um, it, it it the the height of the building, kind of it just means something a little bit different when you have that point of view. It seems like uh, I think in uh, Madison Square Garden, Rem Cool House, that project that didn't happen, also was about the middle, and yourselves at the High Line, that drop down in the middle of 10th Avenue, seems to be about capturing a different level of views or different ways of seeing into the cities. Uh, do you think the romance with height is kind of over with in, uh, in New York? Well, uh, not if you look at, at Hudson Yards. I mean, you know, they're very, very tall buildings. But, you know, the, the height issue, I think, we also felt like when you looked at it in the context of the site model, that the long views weren't the straight on views of the building. I th so I think you know, that, was, that was a substantial influence to try and get to address those diagonal views um, in a way buildings don't always do, uh, which certainly deals with height. What floors do, does the, uh, the corset begin at? I mean, how high up is that? 37, that 37, yeah. 37, it's about 18 floors. Were you, did you study to see if that was a point at which certain parts of the city could be seen? Oh, we, we, were, we, we were fussing with the that whole. forever. Um, yeah, it was like tailoring, you know, or just nip and tucking and, and, um, and exploring in millions of models, and some of which are next door, mm. um, uh, st the study models. Um, but 
yeah, this was, um, it was kind of a personal uh, challenge also to, to try to contribute in some way to this project. And to the west side, um, the, you know, the, the center of gravity is moving from the center of Manhattan to the west side. And uh, the, the new train line is going to be there. And the, uh, you know, there's just a lot going on. Um, the, the, the High Line itself now being bookended um, with Whitney to the south and Culture Shed to the north and um, the, the development of, of the High Line all around there and then the, the whole development of the far west side. It's, it's just, you know, it's significant. It's, it's uh, dense, it's high. I think and we, it's, we liked being on the south end of the development because it did anchor it into the city in an interesting way. So as I mentioned, the High Line, uh, the uh, culture shed enters from, from below. So how does it connect? So it connects to the High Line at one level, potentially under the High Line, and then it's all kind of rail yard on the back. The building itself is not, is only partially on the rail yard, or is Space some is of it solid yard. ground? It's from the north mm -hmm. and the west. Um, the, the tower is, is on uh, terra firma. All of it. Yeah. yeah. And there's a little bit of it that is over overlapping the new Amtrak. The north. Um, but it's, uh, it, effectively, it's the part that isn't uh, platformed. Mm -hmm. um, on the, to the south, we have the High Line, and the High Line just uh, passes by, basically. Um, we're, the topography changes in, like, very radically <laughs> to the north and uh, east, west, and north. And so we have different top topographical elevations at different opportunities at different levels. Um, so the, the building, you cannot... It doesn't really connect. The tower does not connect to the High Line, um, but it, it has that the very large adjacency and takes advantage of the High Line um, in the lobby and uh, you know and kind of generally it acknowledges the does High Line. Does it touch it? I mean, does no. is there no mm -hmm. no because you know we we need to keep a five foot gap. That's, exactly. I think that's something. <laughs> thanks to that, Amanda. <laughs> thanks to Amanda and actually the architects. You know we. Um, Those we, Highline we, architects are tough. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain zoning restrictions that actually the city put on on that, and 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 they're really smart and good. Um, we Although are going we, we, to. We are evolving away t for the Highline to have an interesting view into the building um, that started to emerge. The 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 main entrances are going to be. Uh, Let's see. It's um, it's it's south, west, and uh, north, mm -hmm. and um, and so it really captures. It, it, the, it's very contiguous to the surface of the ground. So um, while the High Line is this kind of otherworldly place that goes by, um, we have um, a, a a large tangent area uh, to the High Line, which is going to have a, a connector, actual connector just a little bit to the east and just beyond the culture shed um, where a big flow of people is going to be able to move north-south um, and connect up with the interior of Hudson Yards and um, also with the, with the northern part of the building. So it's really connected to the avenue, to the, to the uh, northern edge of Chelsea and into the arts, into the center of the arts. And how in uh, doing the design for the tower, how conscious of the other towers the, uh, uh, you know, what they were, were you, were you all do designing simultaneously? Were you aware of each other? Were you wanting to relate? Yeah, we were, wanting, I mean, to everyone was aware. There were, there were um, two or three, I, won't, I don't know if there were work sessions, but there were internal presentations where everyone working on one of the pieces talked about what they were doing. And um, it, w it was actually a smart, good way to do it. And I think it's turned out not to be, you know, competitive trophies but much more of a, an ensemble where n no one is sort of stepping on anyone else's toes. Um, but the, the very much we were aware of what the other towers were doing. Right, and, and there was a master plan and that was really thought, thoughtfully done uh, with a circuit of, um, of, of roads and, and also and paths and a, and a big public space um, with that's um, landscaped and landscape has changed at least I don't know how many times it keeps three times three significant major changes but um, the one thing that I actually learned um, working um, with related is just how, uh, how how dynamic and how you know how the everything changes all the time like the the consequence of one thing here 
has an effect on over there and an effect over there. And it's really one big project, you know, with several architects that are doing these micro projects there. Um, but it's all, you know, with a kind of unified vision. And it couldn't, couldn't be done really anywhere else. It's not like a singular plot. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big ensemble project. For both, is this the first high rise for both of you? Yep. I mean, that's that's been built. And how, I mean, traditionally, of course, developers tend to be a little risk averse. How did you, uh, you know, did you embed some some risk into it, some experimentation, or how did you kind of satisfy yourselves while also, uh, you know, keeping the developer happy? Yeah. Well, I don't. I think related inviting us to do this together. I think, I think they knew what they were getting into. It indicated a certain amount of <laughs> risk invitation. Um, I, I think one of the things we tried to do was push push it as far as we could. But in each case, as Liz talked about, the CATIA model, ha being able to demonstrate that not only could we do a beautiful drawing showing how it would work and why it would do what it would do and have these small-scale fluid models, but the ability to really get into a level of detail that they're used to, I think, brought them on to um, the, the, the risk and the excitement of going for something sort of incredible and uh, not traditional. You know, we were also, because of the Culture Share Project, um, we were, you know, uh, I, mean, I think from Related's point of view, there would have to be a marriage there. And so it would make sense to have the same architects do both projects because, you know, you affect one thing, you affect another. There are structural, uh, structure, structurally conjoined When did uh, they elements. become conjoined? I mean, was that... Did the one become the other? Uh, Culture Shed actually had a different orientation initially, um, and that as it became more and more real, um, the site for it morphed and changed and became an east-west site before it was a north-south site. And as it became clear in some ways, it was going to energize a lot of huts and yards, that it was going to be part of what was going to attract other people to want to be there. Uh, you know, so the only cultural building? Uh, yeah, in the custom yards. Yeah, it's in, in that, in that, uh, in the yards. It, it, um, you know, I, I think that the there was an alignment of the stars for us. Really, truly, it had to do with um, an idea. It had to do with a city administration, and it had to do uh, with a d developer that was actually willing to do this. You know, it, we could culture check could never have happened if we didn't have access to a site that was beyond the limits of the, of the original plot of land, the 21,000 square feet. Um, so there was a lot of collaboration with Related on Culture Shed to enable it to happen. And, and, and not always easy. I mean, in terms of you know, risk aversion, it was a difficult, tough project in that it's a, you know, it has a big footprint and it has a lot of ramifications, but they were willing to continue to stay in there and we kept morphing it and moving it until it worked. And 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 there are the the logics that allow kind of both projects to depend on each other in a funny way. The culture shed also takes advantage of the lower levels of of the tower uh, because they're less they're less important. So we have mechanicals and we have our cores and, and offices and so forth. So th that's why there's a a deep conjoining uh, between these two things. And so they have to be evolved as a single building, effectively, but still with two clients. Um, and so we were the really the, the, the best choice for doing that, even though uh, Related might have had second thoughts. Well, you know, there could be somebody that's easier, faster, less expensive, you know, will not produce uh, problems that has done it many times before. But um, it was a kind of... You know, it was a kind of two-way risk um, that I think. Would they be constructed at the same time, or are they? Yes. So, so if one one can't really slow down, uh, they have to continue a pace, I assume. Or, yeah. yeah. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think um, you know, as far as the whole process went, um, it was uh, it was it was kind of very fluid. You know, because we were watching out for the the health of both projects at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just protecting one; it was actually. Um, making them both good, and you know why would we as Culture Shed want a neighbor of somebody else? You know why wouldn't we want ourselves as the neighbor? So then, 
you know, then the language started to kind of work together and then the opportunities of using one against the other and docking them and... Are the materials uh, the same? I mean, I, the tower's glass, the different tower. kinds of glass, and the culture shed... They're, they're, they're quite different, but they share some vocabulary, but mm -hmm. different materials. The, 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 the glass, the, the base building of uh, culture shed is glass as well, and it will be uh, conceived in the same ilk uh, as the tower, but the shed itself is ETFE, uh, pillows, and it's a very lightweight structure, and it's air-filled, and um, it performs in a, in a very different way. What, are there any uh, engineering challenges to the building that you might address? I mean, I'm not, you said that the, uh, uh, the girdle was not a uh, structural piece, but uh, were there, are there any experiments in engineering going on there? In the shift from, I think the the experiments in engineering that are most notable probably are the curtain wall and um, not the structure itself. The, although the the structure is quite complex, it's it's relatively straightforward. And the wetting um, of those different yeah. kinds of glass has, has yeah. been curtain done wall before. was 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 complicated and required. Um, you know, in some ways, trying because it was easy to do if it was all slumped glass, if it was all one-off curved glass, and the fact that uh, it's not, you know, the east-west and north-south dimension aren't the same created really interesting, difficult challenges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the um, uh, th there were many issues around, you know, how to make the apartments and the size of the apartments and location of structure and so forth, and um, I think that, you know, as far as the standard, you know, we're far off standard, mm -hmm. this whole project. Um, but it's, tr and, you know, there are transfers and there are some interesting things that are happening uh, towards the lower part of the building. Um, but yes, the, the, the engineering tour de force really is the surface and, um, and really being able to... Um, um, you know, with this technology, really, I have to say that it's it's we co couldn't have done because it actually, it it well, gauges it everything. Yeah. It gauges everything. Yeah. Slabs. It's fascinating and, to be able to pull the tuck point in on the strap, and almost like you were stitching a fabric, see the all the glass panels change and what the ramifications were of getting that exact right amount in and out. Mm -hmm. Well, the, are those what are those made of? I mean, will that be? Uh, uh, what kind of material is the, str the, the strap you refer to? The, the straps are going to be precast, probably, mm -hmm. and we're just looking at, at different, mm -hmm. you know, ideas. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not it, it it needs to be thin enough. It has a kind of value from the inside out and outside in, um, and uh, we're still exploring it. So it's it's uh, we're at a stage where it's in progress. And how are the, the larger context of the, the site and the, the neighborhood beyond the High Line, how does it relate to, to that larger context? And a lot of Hudson Yards seems like you're going along the gas stations and the chop shops, the automobile, and then suddenly there's Hudson, Hudson Yards. How yeah. um, are you, does the project do anything to mitigate that transition from, you know, old Chelsea or whatever it's called to, to Hudson Yard? It's uh, well, you know, it's it's a, it's really uh, it's a huge transition. I mean, there is migration actually. You know, as as uh, uh, architects also of the High Line, we've seen uh, an enormous change. You know, when back when the High Line was to be demolished because the value of, because it devalued the properties. You know, around it. Um, to, to, to fast forward to when these sites are being flipped and they're becoming more and more expensive and people aren't building yet on them. but um, And then all of a sudden you get these blades of uh, glass actually that are starting to come up along the High Line. And then as you uh, transition up, there's more of a radical change that's starting to happen when you get into that neighborhood. I think that you know for us, that, that joint between Chelsea and... Um, what we call the far west side, that's, that there is a point uh, along there. And I, I have to say one thing, um, that, that, that uh, our studio is in the Starrett Lehigh building, which is just on 26th Street, and um, my office right on the corner is looking right at the site, and we're going to actually screw up my view 
uh, and Rick's view. We're there totally gonna, it's going to be right in the way. Um, so, you know, we have, <laughs> we have like really mixed feelings. We want this to happen as soon as possible. We don't want it to happen. Let's delay it. <laughs> we don't have that problem. We face Union Square and they're not nothing. Um, you, you made an interesting point about the High Line. And I think if you think about it in a larger context with the Whitney happening, the South and Signature now on 42nd Street, and what's happening culturally along that axis. It's sort of fascinating. Uh, and it is, I think it puts this building, the tower and the culture shed, at a very interesting knuckle uh, and, and kind of an axis that, um, that feels like, it, you know, it's a huge development, but I think it's woven in in a couple of key ways that over time will, uh, will be very integrated. What are some of those key ways? Well, there's the transition of 30th Street, mm -hmm. Chelsea, into uh, and, and the, the fact that that is an access point. Um, there's the high, the, the, all of Hudson Yards has, uh, you know, a big network of public spaces that yeah. you've probably all heard about um, that our tower enters off of. Uh, and 11th Avenue, is, it comes around, is, is adjacent to that. So I think culturally, street grid-wise, um, you know, I, I think that that's what, it, it's certainly the biggest part of um, new city you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's in a place that uh, will, will be a destination in a way that all of these other things are pointing to. I think, you know, and, and to be frank, I mean, I've had mixed feelings about the density, you know, all the way along. Um, when we chose to do the project, we, um, we also acknowledged that we could make a difference um, actually in that transition. And um, it was a, you know, not only a personal challenge that we wanted to undertake and an opportunity, but um, there, you know, New York is filled with super juxtapositions. And this is a weird, surreal one. <laughs> you know, uh, the high line is there, and then all of a sudden we have these super, super tall buildings. Um, and we've been also as we have been uh, evolving. What, what, Rick? What? Madison Square. Oh, Madison Square, yeah. Um, Madison Square. Well, that's changed, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not a, okay, I thought, I thought he was going to. The answer and, is Madison Square. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but we are, um, yeah, we were the, Rick is referring to Madison Square Garden and that, uh, you know, there was this, um, Municipal Art Society uh, right. call to action about like how to you know the whole West Side is changing and upheaval. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally, it's it's totally, and and needs um, some serious uh, connection back into the center of Manhattan. So the, the, anyway, there's a, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of territory, and you know, um, also working on the High Line, there's a. We, we hold on to the romance and the, the beauty of this industrial city, you know, partially industrial city, semi-industrial buildings. Um, we look at the chop shops, we look at the open lots, you know, and um, we, we actually think that, that you know, that, that's really beautiful. That is the gritty, nitty, gritty New York. Um, how do we prevent it from getting totally taken over, totally built up? There's a part of us that feels very unsettled also about the nostalgia of that. You know, like how do we, um, you know, how, how do we as New York citizens kind of think forward, uh, you know, uh, also preserve our histories, you know, and find that fine line between progress and holding on to history. And it's, it's a real... And do you think the, um, with the intense density going on there, enough thought has been... Uh, towards the infrastructure? Is the number seven going to be enough to serve all that? You know, is there, I mean, it's yeah. beyond, beyond your pay grade, but, yeah, it but is, I wonder. It is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's a huge step in the right direction uh, to bring the public to the west side, and it's a kind of springboard uh, for, for things to happen, and I. It's either that or the South Bronx. <laughs> Well, and, and, and that whole, you know, the, that, that area is, um, one is thinking about the logics all the time, you know, and, and um, improving it, um, uh, making uh, spaces that are points of destination, 
uh, to more and more space in Manhattan. Manhattan is finite, so you don't get, this is like the last big development area, you know, and it's kind of amazing to be a part of it. Um, but you, you, then you rapidly run a space. So how do, how do these spaces become destination spaces? How can they be filled with, <clears throat> with um, green space and with culture and with um, you know, destinations for, for food and, and other things? And this is, you know, in, a, in a way, it's the, it's the way that New York, New York has always been about real estate and about you know, every um, square foot you know, means a lot and c continues to change uh, value. But how do you intertwine that value with different kinds of soft values, and um, like spending your leisure time and cultural development and so forth? And the, uh, we think that this is being knitted together in an interesting way. So before I turn over uh, to the floor for questions, which of the two of you is uh, better at making presentations to, or should I ask related? <laughs> do you do them together when you're speaking to the client? We do them together, and I think um, we do them together. I tend to do without the microphone. Um, good, 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 cop, <laughs> good, good cop, bad cop exchanges. Uh. <laughs> do tell. We, we switch off on that. I think we do it well together, and I think we do it well separately and we don't feel the need for both of us to do it at the same time, which I think leads to a comfortable co-presentation. And, and you know, the other kind of less visible thing is Rick is sitting here and Charles, um, uh, my partners are also very, very involved in this design process and are at the table uh, with David and, and his team and colleagues and our, our team. And we're actually, you know, just putting a lot of ideas Ideas out there, and we're we're you know we're working very very integrally together. When it comes to the client interface, um, it's you know we pare it down, and so yeah, we have a shtick kind of I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, thank you very much, and uh, perhaps we have some questions from the floor. I don't know if there's a mic floating around, but yeah, uh, yeah? there it is. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, you can have one. <laughs> well, okay, they're related. <laughs> um, the the uh, it's it sounded it sounded from your presentation as, as though you you kind of came to this with a little, as you said, a little trepidation, and 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 that sort of led to oh my god, we got to make it iconic. It's our first tower, we got to make it iconic, as opposed to what I would have guessed from your other work would have been something. It's like let's not worry about that. It'll it'll come out of the process. Um, was that, you know, coming, f is that because of the way you were working in this case or because of, you know, Related really wanted, said, said make it iconic in a signature or, um, and the other part of the question was actually, was quite technical how, how the, 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 you didn't mention the wind tunnel effects on the, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the, the, this, this might be something that informed the design, that the, the, the wind tunnel of the upper portion, the, the lateral force on the upper portion would be much, less because of the curves and on the lower portion, which is exactly what you would want. Um, and so you might speak to that tactical thing too. Well, I, I don't think, although in a condensed presentation it may sound like the goal was how to create an iconic building, I think we felt like the size of the building merited a lot of study about what its impact was in the ensemble of other buildings there and the, and the skyline. So it grew out of really dealing with the mass of that building. And, and, um, and I think we, we, we did feel like, since it was linked in some way to the culture shed, that the, um, the common spaces, the public spaces, although they're not open to the public, they're for the building, would be the thing that would be interesting to have be visible if something were to be more visible in the tower, so if we're just a plinth. So it really came from studying the the size of it and what kind of impact it would have. I yeah, I, you know, I would also say that the the you're absolutely right that the surfaces, the rounded surfaces, really helped structurally, and that was a good selling point um, on it. But um, you know, the, the I, we never used the word icon. Um, we we wanted to do something with this building. Um, in the end, um, this is one kind of building typology which is about shape. And our studio is not formally oriented, you know, it's programmatically oriented, and David's as well. And um, we, uh, you know, the, the apartments would be 
similar to kind of apartment, you know, we're not reinventing the apartment. Um, but where there was freedom, where there was an opportunity, was in the, the high rise itself and, um, and the conventions of the high rise and how it touched the ground, how it um, ended, and we still are not satisfied with the top, but, you know, and how it translates. And the, the part of the program that really that we started with was this 50-50 um, rental to condo and the transition. So I think it was very much generated from how do you make that transition? You could make it smooth, you could make it abrupt, you could make it, um, you know, kind of ge geometric. Um, and and so it really kind of came out of that. And also, I have to say that there's a part of this, it kind of sounds corny, but there was a kind of feminine twist to it, you know, and the, the kind of notion that you're gonna have this kind of rigid thing coming out of the ground. Can you soften it? Can you make it a little bit different? And so the corset really comes from this, Really, you know, this pinching of the waist, and we really kind of felt that the um, that the top of the building um, just became more statuesque in a in a funny way. So there was a kind of allusion to a, f a figure. It was always there, but in um, you know, in this kind of more abstract way. Kind of goes with Chelsea, you know, maybe the curve. <laughs> Next, <laughs> uh, way back there. Uh, in your pursuit of the final design for Tower D, did you have any specific visual elements that were intended to evoke the Hudson Yards of the past? The Hudson Yards of the past. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, w I would say maybe less on Tower D than Culture Shed itself, which um, deals with mobility, and um, that's the evolution that, tr yeah, and, it's a building that moves on tracks. And grows out of sort of the gantry crane yeah. Presidents. Not the towers so much. The kind of industrial past and, and that building, it has a really big kind of industrial scale space to it. Um, so I think in that way, and then the, the culture shed informed the tower um, in certain kinds of logics, but they're not, it's not overtly um, a historical reference. Any other questions? Uh, if not, yes, oh, is there? Oh, there you are. Yeah, sorry. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the culture shed? Is it like a placeholder, or does it have a program yet, or is it just general and whatever program goes in? Um, so the culture shed, I mean, we could say a couple of words around the culture shed. It's not yet, you know, it's not yet there, but it's, it's becoming there. Um, and it it's also in um, community board approvals. It's at, it's in a place where we as a group aren't talking about it a lot for a reason. It's it's quite developed, um, and so the strategy of how to talk about it uh, is 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 soon. So we think early fall, um, but it's not a placeholder, um, and the hope is that it will offer. Um, some really interesting new kinds of spaces to all kinds of existing organizations that don't have the space to do what it's offering. So there's a, and there's a deep amount of research that's been going on in that and continues to go on. So I would say early fall is when um, we'll be able to talk about it fully. And um, just to add to that a little bit, that it comes um, from uh, a need that New York has that it doesn't have uh, a big, um, let's say, brand-free kind of space that could be used. Spaces. Spaces. So it's a group. That you know, there there are many exhibitions that just bypass New York and don't stop because the museums are you know there's just a hu hugely long cycle uh, for exhibitions and there's no there are no spaces, but what we're what we're doing there like a Kunsthalle. Um, but what we're doing there is not only kind of a convergence of variety of the arts, but also creative industry. And that's um, a very new thing also that is a kind of paradigm shifting. So we've been evolving this project over m multiple years and it's congealing 
um, into this this very very um, is becoming more and more real by the day, In, including space. lots of conversations with um, local cultural institutions, uh, national cultural institutions that that will all that are all having some say in it. In other words, attend your community board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I just want to say thank you very much to uh, to David and Liz. And, uh, I think there's a reception.